Hi everyone. So today we would be talking about the chapter chemical coordination and integration. Now, what do you mean by coordination? Coordination is the process through which two or more organs interact and complement the functions of one another. When we talk about the coordination system in our human body, we mainly talk about two types of coordination system. The one is your neural coordination system and the other is your chemical coordination system. In neural coordination system, it provides an organized network of point to point connections for a quick coordination. So basically, your neural coordination system mainly um, talks about your central nervous system and the various other parts or um, structures associated with it. And the next one is your chemical coordination system. When you talk about the chemical coordination system, we mainly talk about two types of glands. That is the exocrine gland and the endocrine glands. Now let us see what are the differences the both has. Exocrine glands are those glands which release their secretions to their target cells for their action through their own duct. That is, the exocrine glands has their own duct. Whereas in case of your endocrine glands, endocrine glands are ductless glands. That is, they release their secretions directly into the blood. That is, they do not have any duct. Now, the exocrine glands secrete a variety of things from enzymes to mucus. Whereas in case of endocrine glands, the secretions are hormones. The third uh, difference is that in case of the exocrine gland, they secrete onto an epithelial surface located over target. Whereas in case of the endocrine glands, they secrete hormones or they secrete their secretions into the blood or lymph nodes directly located away from the target. Now these are the major basic differences that you have to know when you talk about an exocrine and an endocrine gland. Here we have an example of an exocrine gland. The salivary glands are your exocrine glands. So basically they will have their own duct. Here we have three types of salivary glands. The first one is a parotid gland which has its own duct called as the parotid duct. The second one is your sublingual gland, which has its own duct called as the sublingual duct. Here you can see the sublingual duct. And the third one is your submandibular gland, which has its own duct called as the submandibular duct. Now uh, the first diagram shows a uh, the location of the parotid gland, the sublingual gland and the submandibular gland. And here you can see uh, the location of the duct is also shown. The three of this duct has got its own names. So the name of the duct are only asked in your entrance um, exam. So I prefer or I recommend you all to take the screenshot of the next slide or just make a note of it so that you won't forget it. So, the parotid gland has its duct called as the Stenson's duct. The submandibular gland has its duct called as the Watson's duct. And the sublingual gland has its duct called as the Rivenian duct. I think it's clear. So, up to here we now know that there are two types of glands. The exocrine gland and the endocrine gland. And exocrine gland uh, releases enzymes and the endocrine gland releases hormones. And we have also learned the name of the duct that the parotid and the sublingual and the submandibular uh, gland has. And now we will go into the chapter. Before entering into the chapter, uh, we will, in this chapter we will be talking about the endocrine glands. So it is must to know that what are hormones since the endocrine glands releases hormones. So, hormones are non-nutrient chemicals which act as intercellular messengers and are produced in trace amount. So, this is 
the basic scientific definition that we give to hormones. So hormones are non-nutrient chemicals which act as intercellular messengers and are produced in trace amount. As you can see in this diagram, we have the location of various endocrine glands. Starting from our brain, we have the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the pineal gland all located in your brain. And then we have the thyroid and parathyroid gland. Then we have the thymus gland. And then the pancreas and the adrenal gland. Then you have the female and male gonads. That is, uh, you have the ovary and you have the testis. The ovary in female and the testis in male. So these are the location of the various endocrine glands present in a human body. So uh, in this session or in this part, we would be talking about the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the pineal gland. So let us uh, see one by one and the hypothalamus and the pituitary would be taken together so that it would be much, much easier to understand the concepts. The hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is also called as the master gland and a very important thing to note over here is that the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus is the gland uh, you have seen its location in the previous slide. So the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. So pituitary gland has two lobes. The one is the anterior pituitary and the next is the posterior pituitary. Uh, we would be talking about it in detail in the upcoming slides. So the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary is, in di is, in, is controlled by the hypothalamus through a portal system and the posterior pituitary is uh, directly under the control of the hypothalamus. This is a point that you should remember throughout this chapter. Now let us see the location of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is located on the diencephalon region of the forebrain. Here you can see the location of the hypothalamus. Here the green colored part is your hypothalamus and as you can see it has got a stalk to which a two lobed structure is attached. So the green colored part over there is your hypothalamus which has got a stalk downwards to which a two lobed structure is attached. That diagram or the, that green part and its stalk and the two lobed structure is detailed is uh, drawn or uh, made detailed in this part so you can see over here this is your hypothalamus it has got a stalk and a two lobe structure attached to the end so the stalk is called as infundibulum so hypothalamus uh, has a stalk called as infundibulum to which a two lobe structure is attached now this two lobe structure is your pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus by a stalk called as infundibulum. Now as you can see it has got an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. This uh, diagram is the diagram that is taken from your NCRT textbook. Now let us see the two lobes. The anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. The anterior lobe is also called as the adenohypophysis and the posterior lobe is also called as a neurohypophysis. The anterior lobe has two functional unit cells. The adenohypophysis or the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe that is a neurohypophysis are anatomically divided. Now the anterior lobe or the adenohypophysis has got two functional cells. They are the pars uh, distalis and the pars intermedia. As you can see uh, the pars intermedia is uh, seen over here and here also we do have uh, another functional unit cell called as the pars distalis. In case of the posterior lobe we have a functional unit cell called as pars nervosa. 
So, anterior lobe has got two functional unit cell, the pars distalis and the pars intermedia, whereas the posterior lobe has got only one unit cell called as the pars nervosa. Now you can see that the two lobes are uh, attached or situated in a depression. You can see a depression over here and this depression is called as cella tersica. It is called as cella tersica and this depression is seen in your sphenoid bone. Again, this is a part which is commonly seen in your MCQs. So, the depression is seen in your sphenoid bone. As I have said earlier, the pituitary gland is anatomically divided into adenohypophysis and neurohypophysis. The adenohypophysis is controlled by a portal system and the neurohypophysis is under the direct control of the hypothalamus. Um, this point was uh, said earlier in the previous slide that the adenohypophysis or the anterior lobe is directly uh, uh, is controlled by a portal system whereas the posterior lobe or the neurohypophysis is directly under the control of the hypothalamus. Now the second point what we discussed was that the adenohypophysis has two functional unit cells that is the pars distalis which is commonly called as anterior pituitary and the pars intermedia. And the third point that we have discussed was the neurohypophysis has pars nervosa which is also called as your posterior pituitary as its functional cell. I hope it's very clear. And the next, uh, the fourth point that we have discussed was the pituitary gland is located in a bony cavity called cella tersica. The depression was called or the depression in the bony cavity was called as your cella tersica and the depression was seen in your sphenoid bone. Please don't forget this point because it's very important. Now here, let me tell you something interesting. When you were in your embryonic stage, when you were in the womb of your mother, when you were in your, an embryonic stage, your pituitary gland was actually a three-loop structure. So this is your infundibulum, here you have the anterior lobe, uh, intermediate lobe and the posterior lobe. So in your, during your embryonic stage, your pituitary was a three lobe structure. The, um, this one is your anterior lobe, this one is your intermediate lobe and this one is your posterior lobe. And when you gradually completed your uh, growth in the womb of your mother, your uh, pituitary gland became a two-loop structure. Now let us see how. The intermediate lobe got incorporated or attached to the anterior lobe and became the part of the adenohypophysis. That is, when you completed your growth uh, from the embryonic stage, when you completed your growth in the womb, your intermediate lobe got incorporated and attached got and got attached to the anterior lobe uh, and it became a part of the um, adenohypophysis so as i have said earlier the adenohypophysis has got two functional unit cells that is the pars distalis or you commonly call it as the anterior pituitary and the second one was pars intermedia so actually the pars intermedia was the functional unit cell of the intermediate lobe that you had when you were an embryo. I hope it is clear. So in embryonic stage you had three lobe structure for your pituitary gland and when you grew up, when you completed your growth, your pituitary gland gradually became a two lobe structure. Is that clear? Now. One more interesting point to note over here is that the hypothalamus and the neurohypophysis that is your posterior pituitary. The hypothalamus and the neurohypophysis or the posterior pituitary are orig or were originated 
from the same tissue that is they were originated from the same tissue or developed from the same tissue whereas your adenohypophysis or the anterior pituitary we now we commonly call the adenohypophysis as your anterior pituitary whereas the adenohypophysis is originated from a different tissue let us see from where in embryogenesis rut case pouch please do remember the name of this pouch that is rut case pouch in embryogenesis or during embryogenesis rut case pouch and evagination at the roof of at the roof of the developing mouth in front of the buccopharyngeal membrane comes out and attaches near the posterior pituitary as anterior pituitary nothing to worry just uh, look at the slide this is your uh, hypothalamus the diencephalon region you can see a yellow colored part here that is your uh, posterior pituitary and this membrane is your buccopharyngeal membrane from the buccopharyngeal membrane a pouch you can see a pouch over here a pouch uh, came up which then got attached near the posterior pituitary and at last it became your anterior pituitary so the pouch rut case pouch from the buccopharyngeal membrane moved uh, originate which was originated from the buccopharyngeal membrane uh, moved up up and up and at last uh, it got attached near the posterior pituitary as your anterior pituitary so this is your hypothalamus this is your uh, posterior pituitary which uh, uh, which was originated from the same tissue from where your hypothalamus was originated and this is your anterior pituitary which was originated from the rut case pouch so it is very very important to know the name of the pouch that is a rut case pouch now in the first uh, slide we have learned that the anterior pituitary or the adenohypophysis is under the control of the hypothalamus through a portal system now what is portal system portal system is actually a vascular arrangement in which blood from the capillaries of one organ is transported to the capillaries of another organ by a connecting vein now let me make it simple basically the deoxygenated blood from one organ would go to the heart for for uh, oxygenation uh, for uh, releasing the carbon dioxide out so basically you know that the deoxygenated from one organ would go to your heart consider a situation where the deoxygen let this be an organ a um so this be an organ a and this be an organ b just con just consider two organs so when the deoxygenated blood from the organ a would move to organ b basically we know that the deoxygenated blood from an organ would go to the heart but consider a system where the deoxygenated blood from one organ moves to the uh, other organ through the uh, veins and other capillaries a system a new system is established here such systems are called as portal system in a human body we come across two portal system the one is your uh, hepatic portal system and the other is the hypothalamic hypophysal portal system hepatic portal system is a portal system established when blood moves from your small intestine to liver so hepatic portal system is the portal system established when the deoxygenated blood or simply blood moves from small intestine to liver and the second one was your hypothalamic hypophysal portal system or simply hypophysal portal system this is the portal system established when blood moves from the hypothalamus to the pituitary 
or your anterior pituitary. Now let us see why. Why the blood from the anterior uh, from the hypothalamus move to the anterior pituitary. Before uh, knowing that, uh, we uh, the hypothalamus has neurosecretory cells called nuclei which produce hormones. We know that the hypothalamus is an endocrine gland. So hypothalamus would definitely release hormones. Now the cells which release hormones from the hypothalamus are called as nuclei. So nuclei are a group of neurosecretory cells that release hormones. Okay, is that clear? So here we have a diagram. You have your hypothalamus. And a portal system is established in a relationship with the hypothalamus and your anterior pituitary through the veins and the capillaries and all other different uh, veins and uh, capillaries. So, why there is a need for a portal system over here? Why, why we need a portal system in relationship with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland? We said that the hormones released by the endocrine glands are released to the blood and they are carried or transported to the target cells. Now, the hormones released by the hypothalamus uh, would go to the blood. Now, the, when this blood would reach, the, reach your heart, this blood would, would contain your hormones, the hormones released by the hypothalamus. Now, when this blood containing the hormones released by the hypothalamus would reach your heart, the hormones get diluted and it won't reach its specific target cell to complete their action. Hence, a portal system is established here. So, the, this portal system helps the hormones released by the hypothalamus to reach your anterior pituitary. Why? We know that the hypothalamus is the gland that controls the pituitary gland. Hence, a portal system is established here. It's nothing confusing. Just know that a portal system is established uh, here and this portal system is named as the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system or simply the hypophyseal portal system. Now, let us see what are those hormones released by the hypothalamus that reach your anterior pituitary. So, the hormones released by the nuclei, the nuclei are the group of neurosecretory cells that release hormones. Nuclei are of two types, which regulate the synthesis and release of anterior pituitary, whereas the posterior pituitary release the hormones that are synthesized by the hypothalamus. So, uh, here, just uh, note that the uh, hormones released by the hypothalamus would move to the anterior pituitary and uh, the, uh, ho those hormones controls or commands the anterior pituitary to release their hormones. Whereas in case of the posterior pituitary, posterior pituitary won't synthesize, posterior pituitary don't synthesize their own hormones. Whereas, posterior pituitary releases hormones that are synthesized by the hypothalamus. We would make it clear in the upcoming slides. So, the hormones released by the hypothalamus which move to the um, anterior pituitary are of two types. That is, the releasing hormone and the inhibiting hormone. So, Releasing hormone are those hormone released by the hypothalamus that moves to the anterior pituitary and the releasing hormone commands or controls the anterior pituitary to release, the, to release their hormones. That is to release the hormone synthesized by the anterior pituitary. Whereas the inhibiting hormones are those hormones which controls or commands the anterior pituitary to inhibit the synthesis of their hormones. To inhibit the synthesis of the anterior pituitary hormones. I hope it's clear. Now, now we will see the hormones released by the anterior pituitary in response 
to the hormones released by the hypothalamus so uh, you know that the uh, hypothalamus releases the releasing hormone and the inhibiting hormone which commands or uh, control which commands or controls the anterior pituitary to release or inhibit the secretion of the pituitary hormone the anterior pituitary hormone now the hormones released by the pituitary gland will have the name ending with so this one is an interesting fact this is a small trick so the hormones released by the pituitary gland will have the name ending with stimulating hormone tropin hormones or tropic hormones so this is a um, basic trick to identify if a hormone is released by a released by the pituitary or not now uh, the pituitary uh, gland releases hormones which has got stimulating hormones tropin hormones or tropic hormones as the name in the end uh, there are exceptions but mostly this three would come in the name of a hormone if it is released by the pituitary now let us see the hormones released by the anterior pituitary now we will be talking about only the anterior pituitary one by one the first one is your growth hormone so growth hormone is also called as somatotropin so growth hormone is also called as somatotropin and it is abbreviated as gh growth hormone is a abundant hormone in the anterior pituitary now growth hormone releasing hormone and inhibiting hormone controls the release and the inhibition that is the hypothalamus releases the releasing hormone and the inhibiting hormone for the uh, function for the release and or the inhibition of the growth hormone i think it's clear and the third point is that the growth hormone helps uh, you now the function of the growth hormone the growth hormone helps in the growth of bones muscles etc i think it's clear so the growth hormone hormone also called as somatotropin abbreviated as gh is a abundant hormone uh, both growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibiting hormone plays a major role and growth hormone helps in the growth of bones muscles and the various other parts the second hormone released by the anterior pituitary is the prolactin or the milk producing hormone abbreviated as prl so here also the hypothalamus releases a uh, releasing hormone and the inhibiting hormone thus enabling the pituitary gland to release or inhibit the secretion of the prolactin and the function of the prolactin or the milk producing hormone is to produce milk from the mammary gland so the function is to produce milk from the mammary gland and please don't forget that prolactin is also called as milk producing hormone the third hormone released from the anterior pituitary is the melanocyte stimulating hormone the mel in case of the melanocyte stimulating hormone to both uh, the hypo the hypothalamus releases the releasing hormone and the inhibiting hormone enabling the anterior pituitary to release or inhibit the secretion of melanocyte stimulating hormone now what does melanocyte stimulating hormone do melanocyte stimulating hormone or commonly abbreviated as msh helps for the pigmentation of your skin hair your color of iris etc so melanocyte stimulating hormone stimulates the melanocyte to produce melanin so melanin is a pigment that gives color to your hair to your iris and to your skin etc now very very important part to note here is that melanocyte stimulating hormone or msh is the only hormone released by the pars intermedia we, we have learned that the anterior uh, the anterior lobe 
or the adenohypophysis has two functional unit cells, the pars distalis and the pars intermedia. So the pars intermedia releases only one type of hormone and that is your MSH or melanocyte stimulating hormone. Now uh, so we have learned about the growth hormone, prolactin and the melanocyte stimulating hormone and the next one is your thyroid stimulating hormone or we commonly call it as thyrotropin abbreviated as the TSH. So what does TSH do? TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone stimulate the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones. So uh, the thyroid gland and the thyroid hormones we will be dealing later. So just know that the TSH stimulate the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones. Now a very important part to note here is that in uh, in the last slide we uh, have learned that in case of the growth hormone, in case of prolactin and in case of melanocyte stimulating hormone, both the releasing hormone and the inhibiting hormone plays a major role. But in case of TSH, only the releasing hormone plays the role. Now let us see how and why. So only releasing hormone controls uh, TSH that is the hypothalamus releases only releasing hormone that enable the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. We know that anything, anything is good for our body if it is in the normal and the correct level or in the correct amount. If it exceeds its correct if it exceeds its uh, correct level or the normal level, it causes harm. So, when the uh, releasing hormone stimulate or, or ask the anterior pituitary to release a TSH, the anterior pituitary releases TSH and it would stimulate the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones. Now, if the amount or the level of your thyroid hormone exceeds its normal level, it would cause harm to your body. So there should be someone to stop the uh, excess or the excess secretion of the thyroid hormone. So here a negative feedback system is present. So let uh, now let us see what a negative feedback system is. The thyroid glands would definitely uh, release thyroid hormones when the TSH act on it. So when the amount of the thyroid hormone exceeds its normal level, the thyroid hormone in blood would move to the pituitary gland. Your pituitary gland has got receptors for the um, attachment of the thyroid hormone. So your pituitary gland has got receptors for thyroid hormone. Uh, so when the level of the thyroid hormone exceeds, uh, the thyroid hormone moves to the pituitary gland and it attaches to the receptors present in the pituitary gland thus inhibiting further release of the TSH from pituitary gland. So the pituitary hormone itself inhibits the, pitu uh, the pituitary gland uh, from the secretion from the further secretion of the TSH. So a thyroid hormone itself uh, uh, helps for the inhibition for, for the further secretion of the TSH and thus uh, the TSH also moves to the, uh, sorry, so um, the thyroid hormone first attaches to the receptors of the pituitary gland and uh, stops the further secretion of the TSH. And it also moves to the hypothalamus and stops uh, the release or the secretion of the releasing hormone. Now this is known as a negative feedback system. I hope it's clear. Now the next uh, hormone released by the anterior pituitary is called as gonadotropins. So please make sure that in case of the gonadotropins too, a negative feedback system is seen 
since only releasing hormone control is seen. So, gonadotropins act on the gonads. We have learned that gonads in females, they are on the ovaries and in males, uh, the gonads are the testes. Gonadotropins act on the gonads, that is in males, the gonads are the testes and in females, it is ovary. When we talk about uh, the gonadotropins, we mainly talk about two types of hormones. The first one is the follicle stimulating hormone, uh, abbreviated as FSH and the second one is the luteinizing hormone, abbreviated as LH. So, follicle stimulating hormone in females helps in the growth and development of the ovarian follicles. Now, what are ovarian follicles and uh, everything you would be learning in your higher classes? So, just know that in females, FSH helps in the growth and development of the ovarian follicles. Now, in males, FSH regulates spermatogenesis along with the help of androgens. That, uh, so, these are the two functions of FSH. And the second one is your luteinizing hormone. So, luteinizing hormone, abbreviated as LH, in females induces ovulation and maintains the corpus luteum. So, again corpus luteum and ovulation all you will be learning in higher classes. Just know the function, what is the function of the luteinizing hormone. So, luteinizing hormone in females induces ovulation and maintains the corpus luteum. Now, LH in males stimulate the synthesis and secretion of hormones called as androgens. So, LH in males stimulate the synthesis and secretion of hormones called as androgens. Now, um, and everything, the ovarian follicles, uh, what is corpus luteum, what are androgens, you would be learning in higher classes. Uh, now, here you have to learn only the functions. Now, the last hormone released by the anterior pituitary is your adrenocorticotropic hormones. So, it is the adrenocorticotropic hormone. Adrenocorticotropic hormone is uh, also called as corticotropin. So, it is also called as corticotropin. And here too a negative feedback system is observed. So, uh, we have seen that the negative feedback system is observed in case of the TSH, in case of gonadotropins and in case of corticotropin. Now, what is the function of corticotropin? Corticotropin or adrenocorticotropic hormone act on the adrenal cortex. Now, what is adrenal cortex? The outer part of the adrenal gland, the inner part is called as the adrenal medulla and the outer part of the adrenal gland is called as your adrenal cortex. So, um, corticotropin act on the adrenal cortex which help in the synthesis and secretion of steroid hormones called as glucocorticoids. So, uh, glucocorticoids all will be dealt uh, in, uh, in the further part in the last section of this chapter. So, uh, till now we learned that the hormones released by the anterior pituitary are your growth hormone, your prolactin, the melanocyte stimulating hormone and the melanocyte stimulating hormone is the only hormone released by the pars intermedia. Then you have learned about TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, then uh, gonadotropins, the uh, FSH and LH and at last the adrenocorticotropic hormone. These are the hormones released by the anterior pituitary. Now let us see what are the hormones released by the posterior pituitary or your neurohypophysis. Posterior pituitary releases two hormones which are synthesized by the hypothalamus and are transported axonally to posterior pituitary. So, in case of neurohypophysis, there is no uh, portal system seen. Okay. And uh, the neurohypophysis or posterior pituitary do not synthesize its own hormones, but store and release the hormone, uh, release the hormone that are made by the hypothalamus. 
So let us look at the two hormones released by the posterior pituitary. The first one is oxytocin. Oxytocin act on smooth muscles of her body and stimulate their contraction. So oxytocin act on the smooth muscles of her body and stimulate the contraction of the smooth muscles. For example, in females, oxytocin stimulate a vigorous contraction of the uterus at the time of childbirth and milk ejection from the mammary gland. So basically oxytocin uh, show, uh, act on the smooth muscles for effective contraction. So the two examples or the two examples that they gave for the action of oxytocin is at the time of the childbirth where a vigorous contraction of the uterus occurs and during the milk ejection from the mammary gland. So please uh, don't get confused here because prolactin is the milk producing hormone and the oxytocin is the milk ejection hormone. The second hormone released by the neurohypophysis or your posterior pituitary is vasopressin or commonly called as antidiuretic hormone. Vasopressin acts mainly at the kidney and stimulates a reabsorption of water and electrolytes uh, by the distal tubules and thereby reduces the loss of water through urine. And, now, and this process is called as diuresis. So vasopressin, uh, the site of action of vasopressin is your kidneys which helps in the reabsorption of water thus reducing the excess loss of water through urine. Now these are the hormones released by your pituitary gland. Uh, uh, till now we have learned uh, how hypothalamus and the uh, pituitary gland are connected and the hormones released by the two. Now we would look at the disorders. Here we, got, we have got to learn four disorders. The disorders caused by the excess or low secretion of the hormones. The first disorder is a gigantism. So gigantism as the word suggests it is related with the growth hormone. So gigantism happens when there is an over secretion of growth hormone which stimulate abnormal growth of the body. So in gigantism there happens an over secretion of growth hormone. Now the second disorder that we have got to learn is dwarfism. So dwarfism happens or occurs when there is a low secretion of growth hormone resulting in standard growth. And the third one is acromegaly. Acromegaly too is also connected with growth hormone. So in case of acromegaly, there happens to be an excess secretion of growth hormone in adult, especially in the middle-aged people, which can cause severe disfigurement and this disfigurement happens especially in your face. So gigantism, dwarfism and acromegaly three are connected with the secretion of growth hormone which is the abundant hormone of the anterior pituitary. The, uh, the fourth disorder is your diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is an impairment affecting the synthesis or release of ADH. ADH is an antidiuretic hormone which we, call, which we commonly call as vasopressin which was released by the neurohypophysis. So an impairment affecting the synthesis or release of ADH results in a diminished ability of the kidney to conserve water leading to water loss and dehydration. So diabetes insipidus is related with the ADH or vasopressin when there is a problem affecting the synthesis or release of ADH it may cause uh, a diminished ability of a kidney to reabsorb water and uh, electrolytes thus leading uh, to excess water loss through urine and which may cause dehydration for us. So till now we have learned the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the disorders. I hope it's clear. The next gland that we are going to learn is the pineal gland. 
So here we have a diagram which shows the location of your pineal gland. So uh, here you have got your pineal gland. So which is uh, just look at this uh, in the circular part. You have got your pineal gland which is in a magnified view. And the pineal gland uh, secretes or releases a hormone called as melatonin. Here you have the structure of melatonin. You need not by heart the structure. But simply know that the pineal gland releases melatonin. Now, the pineal gland is located on the dorsal side of the forebrain. So, this is the location of your pineal gland. And as I have said, pineal gland secretes a hormone called as melatonin. Now, let us know what are the functions of melatonin. Melatonin helps in regulating 24-hour rhythm cycle of our body. Okay, so melatonin helps in regulating normal uh, rhythm cycle of our body and it also helps in maintaining the body temperature. And also, melatonin influences our metabolism, our pigmentation, the menstrual cycle in females and our defense capability. So these are the four functions of the pineal gland. It's so uh, it's really short to learn and very easy to learn. So in this uh, part or this session, we have learned about uh, uh, the two types of coordination system: what are endocrine glands and what are exocrine glands, what are hormones. Then we have uh, then we have come across the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Uh, then uh, the pineal, uh, then the disorders caused by the hormones released by the pituitary gland. Then we have come across the pineal gland, its function, the hormone released by the pineal gland. So these uh, are the points that you have to note in this session. So uh, the chapter is very easy to learn if you know the concepts very well. And if you like the video, Please do subscribe to our channel's tutors and don't hesitate to ask your doubts in the comment section below and share the video with your friends, families and thank you for watching.